five Q and A on how to buy your first multifamily investment property. I've got my co-host Terrence Doyle. Terrence, what's up, man? What's up? What's up? What's up? It's beautiful out. Sun's out. We're ready to talk about real estate here in the studio. Let's help some people buy their first multifamily property. Yes. So we're going to go through three important steps to keep in mind to go out there and buy your first multifamily property. And as a reminder, this is part of our multifamily mentorship show. We have we are officially launching in two weeks on wow. June 3rd. So it's been a long time to make in. So we appreciate all the people coming out to these Q&A questions. So make sure you come out on June 3rd because we'll do a live Q&A kick off the show. And we have our first episode dropping with Mr. Sterling White, a fellow BP contributor. Who's going to drop us on some content gold on cold calling. Yeah, he's killer. Anyone that wants to get into multifamily, transition from single family, or just wants to expand their knowledge base, Sterling White drops some serious heat. He's got an incredible story growing up in Section 8 housing. He owns tens of millions of dollars worth of real estate now. He's recently relocated to Houston. I think he's also single. So he's got a lot going for him <laughs> there uh, and a lot of reasons to tune in and watch that show. All right. So we got questions coming in. We'll get to those in a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. But Terrence, you got three steps here for us on how to buy your first multifamily property. You told me step one is clearly define your goals. What is that? Why is that important? That's right. Yeah. So I was actually talking with a fellow friend of both of ours, came in this morning, just wanted to meet, wanted some advice. You know, he owns, I think, five or six single family homes, some condos around Denver. Mm -hmm. He's done super well, uh, built a lot of equity. And he said, look, I'd like to buy an eight to 10 unit property. What do I need to do? And so, you know, I got thinking, my juices started flowing about, okay, what, you know, what do you want to do? You know, what did I do back in the day when I was buying my first one? I'd flipped a bunch of houses, had some equity, and I was like, okay, I need to go bigger. I want to get a better return on my time and my money. So the number one thing to realize and to think about and to journal about is what are your goals? What, what are your, what's, what's the outcome you want? Do you want yield? Do you want monthly cash flow? Do you want a multiple on your money? Are you looking long term? Are you fine with setting, you know, putting that money in there and holding it for 10, 15, 20 years? Or do you want more short term? You know, what is it that you want? You know, I would just get a piece of paper and write down every single thing that you're thinking about. You know, what's your current lifestyle look like? Are you married? Are you dating? Are you about to have children? Are you retiring? You know, what are the things that you want to do the next 12, 24, 36 months? And that is going to help define what kind of property you look for. But you know, before you do anything else, you just have to take inventory of yourself, turn off the radio, turn off the TV, ear pods, take them out, go sit by a lake, bench, picnic, whatever, whatever your happy place is, you know, whatever that is for you, Chris, I think you like to go to the mountains and, and, uh, and camp, but oh, yeah. just unplug and write down what are your goals? What is it that you want? And you have to clearly define that. And that is step one. Okay. So how detailed do people need to get? Do they get like, you know, you're talking financial, personal goals, do you want to be a direct ownership, pass, you know, invest, uh, invest passively? Like how clear and nuanced do people need to get? My coach in college said, aim small, miss small. The more detailed you get and thorough, the better, the more precise you will be with hitting the mark. So the more that you can write down under number one of goals, the more dreams you can put down, you know, the more that you can just vomit on paper, the more clearly you're going to be able to define what the property looks like. And that's actually going to help you find the property, right? Because as we go through and we've talked on a lot of different shows about is in order to get people excited to find you your property, which we're going to talk about at step number three, you have to be able to clearly define what you're looking for. And in order to clearly define what you're looking for, you have to know what your goals are. So it, this is fundamental. It's the foundation. Write down as much as you can. Lifestyle, your goals, your dreams, what are the things you're frustrated with right now financially? Uh, all those things matter. Just write it all down and then you can organize it. We can work on organizing it later. Great. All right. So step one is to clearly define your goals. And I 100% agree on there. So we're talking myself, Taryn Stoy, about how to buy your first multifamily property. Define your goals is step one. YouTube, Bigger Pockets members, I'd be curious, type in your goals, type in your questions around what's questions or where you go to for your, your brainstorming happy place, what your goals are. Cause I can write down my goals very clear. I can write down pages of goals. I know you can too, Terrence. So if you have clear goals, write them down. We do like reading them. We might be able to pick on them. And understanding, do you want monthly cash flow or would you rather buy 
in a rapidly growing area have less cash flow but have a lot of appreciation would you rather be in and out of something quickly all those things really matter and it comes down to your stage in life and what you're looking for if you have a really high paying w2 job then monthly cash flow probably isn't the main priority you know maybe it's going to be i'd like to put my money in a really safe place and have it grow over time you know every everybody's situation is different and so it's really important to clearly identify that and write that down all right, Maros, goal, first home, get to 32 units, monthly cash flow. Perfect. All right, moving on to step two. It's the infamous location, location, location. What market are you in? That's right, location. My The number two thing, you know, once you know your goals, you got to really be specific about location. You know, sometimes people that live, let's say in New York or California are notorious for saying, I want to buy in the Midwest. I want to buy in the South. I want to buy in Florida. And it's very, very important to understand where you're going to buy. And my advice with buying is buy where you have a competitive advantage. So if you have family or if you have unique relationships or if you have, you know, whatever, whatever the advantage that you think you have play to that. So don't go to a market where you don't have an advantage because I guarantee you, and I've lived it, there's people in that market that do have an advantage and you will get your chances of winning are very small. So pick a market that you have a competitive advantage. The second part, you know, the addendum to that is pick a location, especially on your first multifamily, right? I've been doing this for 10 plus years. So me picking a location is less important. I could almost buy any part of Denver as long as the price is right. I know how to make money, but I've been doing this for a long time. And so my, you know, my risk, my tolerance for risk is a lot lower, right? I have less chance of failing because of the experience and the resources at my disposal. If you're buying your first multifamily, you don't have that luxury. Your margin for error is much smaller. So you need to aim small. So pick a location that's timeless. Pick a location that is close to grocery, close to a gas station, walkable to restaurants and bars. The example of this is during the pandemic, the places in Denver that had the best locations were the ones that did not see any rent decreases and delinquency, right? There was other markets in Denver that worst locations, people were looking at spreadsheets, maybe didn't know the areas as well and thought everything was going to keep going up. And as soon as there was a downturn or a correction, they got crushed. So the location super important. Number one, pick a location you have a competitive advantage. Number two, pick a location where people are going to want to stay and live and pay rent even during a downturn. Great advice. All right, Terrence, number three, network. Num yeah, that's right. So in order to get a deal, right, is you have to network. And finding deals is directly related to relationships, right? The more relationships you have, the more deals you're going to see, the better deal you're going to be able to buy. So I think, you know, my advice this morning to our, you know, our, our uh, common friend was be patient, build a lot of relationships, network with everybody, bigger pockets, LinkedIn, Go to real estate meetups, meet with as many brokers, wholesalers, meet with people that are in the multifamily space. And then when you meet with them, you need to know your goals and know your location and be able to tell them clearly what you're looking for and be pre-approved. So you have to have your stuff together, right? You have to be organized. You have to be ready. But when you meet these people, if you can tell them exactly what your goals are, your criteria, and you know the location, your chances of getting someone to go out and find your property go up tremendously. Exactly. If people don't know what you want, they're not going to find anything. It's for impossible. You. If you're not organized, they're not going to go out there and like, you know, read your mind and bring in the best deal. You got to do exactly what Taryn said. It's great advice. All right. So we'll start moving into questions here on YouTube comments next one minute. Again, Chris Lopez here, Terrence Doyle. We are doing the multifamily mentor show at Bigger Pockets, and our very first show launches next or two Thursdays from now, June third, with uh, Sterling White, and we have twelve guests. Twelve great people around the industry from around the country in season one of our show, everything from lenders to operators to capital raisers. So make sure you tune in the show. We'll also be doing Q and A's before then as well. We've got some tremendous guests on there and some people that are not on the circuit. So a lot yes. of these people you've probably not heard of, you're right they're, but they're people that are super talented. They've achieved a lot specifically in the multifamily space. So anyone looking to grow their knowledge base, their relationships and their acumen in multifamily, you're going to want to tune in. There's some incredible life stories, incredible examples of deals that they purchased, stabilized, and ways that they solve problems to create value and, and create great returns for themselves and their investors. There's also a lot of stories of failure, which I personally learned a lot from. 
right? A lot of people talk, get really vulnerable, really transparent. We have some whiskey. We're here in the studio. Things get really transparent. And, you know, we learned a lot of things. I learned a ton of from, you know, Robert Martinez, you know, so many just things that he did, you know, from his partnership and failures he had. I mean, there's the some incredible he does on his buildings. Oh yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. So there's, there's you're definitely going to want to tune in. There's every single person has a unique story, a unique spin on multifamily that I, I personally learned a lot from. And anyone that loves multifamily is going to really, I think, get a lot of value out of it. Plus it's in person, which All is right. the fun part. That's right. All right. So got a couple questions here. Actually, this first one goes back to, I think, step one you were talking about, Terrence, around goals. Cam says, do you all remember a specific time when you had to decide between driving into your goals stubbornly and changing course? So I think I understand that question by, hey, when you have to like work harder towards your goals, like are you saying you work towards your goals versus when is it time to work harder versus, you know what, I'm going to stop and pivot and go somewhere else. Call an audible. Yes. Call an audible. Cam, excellent question. I really like where your head's at. I've been th- I've been in both places. There's some times where you get into the middle of a journey towards a goal and it's super, excuse my language, effing hard. And you're like, what am I doing? Did I make the wrong decision? Should I have burned the boat or burned the bridge? You're on the boat. You burned the bridge. Should I have left the W-2 job? Should I have taken the risk? And sometimes the answer is you have to just keep going and get through the rainy, difficult tornado season to, to see the sunlight and to reach the mountaintop. There's other times where you're you're making things more difficult on yourself just because maybe you didn't have the right goal or you had the wrong thesis or the wrong business plan and you need to be able to quickly identify that and adjust and call an audible. Part of that is being an entrepreneur, right? I mean, I make hundreds of mistakes a, a month, hundreds, but I have people around me and I'm able to clearly define when I made a mistake and be able to change course, right? And then there's other times where things are just difficult. Like right now, it's really difficult and I was just talking to you off camera, we're trying to hire right now. And it's really hard. There's not a lot of talented people that fit these roles. And it's really, really hard to find. But, you know, number one, people that are qualified are making a lot of money right now. Number two, the job market's tight for people in real estate because real estate's gone up almost every market in the country. And so it's challenging. But do I think that I need to like go hire robots and change the course of hiring? No, I just need to, I need to brainstorm. I need to network. I need to figure out what other people are doing in the space to hire and define and attract the right people. So Cam, I think that the answer, I don't have a clear answer other than there are certain times where you just have to keep going and press through the difficulty. And there's other times where you need to do a self-analysis and reflection and say, you know what? I made a mistake. I need to adjust and be able to make those changes quickly. And having that high self-awareness is very important. Also having a group of people, your peers, your mastermind group, friends, mentors, whatever, to bounce ideas off them as well. Like I get decision points. I'm like, wow, I need to externalize this. I want to ask, ask you, Terrence, ask other people who I value their opinion. That's right. And you know, my model, you know, my business, you know, my investing strategies. You can say like, no, dude, you're good. Like, no. Yeah. Uh, think about this, you know, consider this. And it just goes back to sometimes what just goes against you. Right. Like, the okay. What? 15 months ago, no one knew what the coronavirus was. Now we all know what the damn coronavirus <laughs> is. And we, I mean, I pivoted, you pivoted, like everyone pivoted when the coronavirus happened. And that's just because we had goals. And all those goals when COVID happened, stop mattering for a while. Some got delayed. Some just got, you know, put on the shelf and never, never see the light of day again. So you have to pivot um, depending on market conditions. Or sometimes Terrence said you have to go through it. I love that image. You've seen this. It's various ones where, you know, it got like two people digging in the dirt to go find gold or diamonds. And they got one guy quits, you know, when he's like a foot away from finding the stash of diamonds. And the other guy keeps digging and finds a diamond mine. Sometimes you have to keep going through it and get to that reward. And sometimes you have to move on and go start digging a new hole. Yeah, absolutely. That's well said. I do like that recommendation, that tip of asking people close to you that know you, you know, and they will be able to tell you whether or not you're onto something and just need to keep going or if it's time to pivot and you made a mistake. All right, Cam, you are so welcome, man. We appreciate the comments and you always showing up. Uh, so Land says, is it worth buying a multifamily in a rural area? So a little bit of the open-ended question there. So, so going, say? going back to our three-part answer on buying multifamily, number one is goals. So my first question to you, Lan, is what are your goals? Are your goals to own something that maybe produces less cash flow and has more appreciation, is more stable, and you're going to have less headaches? Because buying in a rural area is probably like that. 
You're probably not going to have a lot of cash flow. You're probably going to probably at a lower basis though. So you're going to have less risk. Location is the rural area. Do you have a competitive advantage? Do you know someone there? Someone's going to manage it. Do you know who the operator would be? Is it a farm or is it, you know, what is it that you would that makes it, uh, gives you the competitive advantage for that rural area? And, uh, did you network, you know, are you, is this something that's off market or how did it come to you? Um, you know, how many relationships, how many deals have you looked at? You know, if this is the first thing that you've seen, you know, if you've looked at a hundred deals and this is the best one, then man, I think I love it. If this is the first deal you're looking at and you haven't started networking, then I would say network, build relationships and look at more deals. But number one, did you define, does it meet your goals? Are you short-term, long-term? Are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for equity? What is it that you want? And location, do you have a competitive advantage in that location? So those are, that's my response to land. I can tell you, I yeah. want to buy in a rural area. No. You know why? Why? Because I, I have no competitive advantage. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you personally me, should not. I yeah. never would. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I have no competitive advantage, and it's just not part of my business model to buy in a rural area. Now, part of my goal is I really want to buy land to build on in the next five to 10 years. So would I buy land in a rural area? Absolutely, but not looking for cash flow, and it's not my first investment property. It's kind of more of a legacy play for my family to own kind of a farm ranch style property that we can own and stay, keep in our family. So that's one of the goals that my wife and I have made. And so that is something that we would look at, but it's not an investment and it's not my first multifamily. Ooh, here's an interesting question. Claims to fire. What is the most creative way you've used or heard about adding income to a multifamily property? Billboards, a cell tower, et cetera. So what's the most creative and most profitable? I guess two separate questions. Claims there. to fire. I like where your head's at. How do you boost NOI? What's a creative way to boost NOI? So I actually, one of our my partners in our fund is from Atlanta, Georgia. In his prior life, he worked for a REIT and they owned twenty over 22,000 apartments in the Southeast. And he said what they would do is they would do a an easement above each property and that they would own right? That they, so they'd have an easement and it would do all the internet. And I forget the exact name, but it would do the internet, the sales tower, everything, right? So then even they sold the property, right? They would own those rights uh, for the Wi-Fi, the cable, whatever it was. This was back in the early 2000s. So there's cable and, you know, the Wi-Fi was, uh, you know, it was the, you couldn't, it wasn't Wi-Fi. It was it the was, cable. It was the cable. In, right? Exactly. Yeah. I forget the exact name of that, but that's something creative they did that still exist where you put an easement that's basically just like for technology and for those services. And something else to keep in mind is like there's creative and there's also less headache and profitable. Right. So cool. There's some creative stuff, but also there's a tried and true stuff that's just as easy to do, easy to execute, and also just has a significant rim pump on the NOI. So don't lose sight of the basics, the fundamentals, right? Because that always is gonna do the best for you. Yeah, a couple of the ones that we've done. So I've never done that, but if you ask most creative, that's probably the most creative. I've never done that, and I don't have twenty two thousand doors, so I'm not sure it made sense because there's a lot of infrastructure that to go in and legal to enforce that and those kind of things. You know, one of the things we've done is we've turned basements into storage units. We've turned basements into rentable units. We've turned garages into storage units that we can rent. We've started to charge for uh, build back common area utilities. So if we have security, so if we're improving locations, right, and we're adding really great security and entrances and gates and you know, doing new hallway light fixtures. And, you know, if we're doing things that are really improving the quality of someone's experience and making it safer, more comfortable, then we are using some of those expenses and billing that back. So it's just called common area uh, utility bill back. So it's on top of rubs. So it's outside the unit, everything exterior. So if we do a, a big gate on the front, if we're doing a new security uh, system to enter the building, you know, things like that that are adding real value, we're able to bill that back. And that's, those are some of the things that we've done. We've also, obviously not really a secret, you know, adding, we don't charge for, but adding dog park, you know, dog parks and other amenities, I think help, help increase the renewal rate and renewals. As we've learned in a lot of the episodes you and I have done is the most expensive, having vacancies, the most expensive, uh, item on the balance sheet, right? It's vacancy is the number one killer of NOI of net operating income. And so renewals are big. And so we've added amenities, but I think washer and dryers are things we've done commonly adding, taking extra unused space in the basement or exterior and turn it into storage or units. All right. We got questions here from Daniel. Daniel, when looking at a multifamily unit, what books have helped have helped you or resources 
have you guys used in learning how to approach creating a comprehensive analysis to rehab cost? Terrence, that's up your alley between uh, the experience you have and your construction background. Yeah. So what do you do? So the best book on multifamily, in my opinion, is Joe Fairless's best ever book. He does touch on renovation there. He touches on hiring GCs and how to vet them. And he has a good chapter on that. I don't know of a good book specifically for construction and multifamily. So I don't, other than that book, I think that book covers everything and kind of talks on from a syndication standpoint. So it talks about underwriting. It talks about raising the capital. It talks about the CapEx and uh, you know the improvements. So there is a chapter on that. Um, I think the number one resource for me would be find someone that owns multifamily that's done value add in your market and take them to lunch, dinner, coffee, offer to pay for it and pick their brain for 30, 45 minutes and ask them in that market specifically, what are some of the tips that they, they have for managing rehabs in multifamily? I think that is very market specific depending on the climate, depending on if there's rental inspections. There's so many things that are market specific. I would find someone through bigger pockets or LinkedIn that you know is doing value add multifamily and try and connect with them. And because finding like accurate data in books is really hard to do. I just realized this because I'm in the process of publishing. I publish a book every year here in Denver for annual an annual guide to invest in Colorado and Denver. And so this year is great. I'm going to actually write a market report with data trends and some examples. I started writing it back in like November timeframe. Book is just coming out like <laughs> next week. Well, a lot changed the market where our inventory went to nothing. And all the market reports I wrote six months ago is basically trash. Wow. And that's in six months. I mean, same thing with uh, looking at rehab cost. I mean, lumber, has that gone up like a couple hundred percent? Concrete, electrical Just wiring. everything has gone yeah. up. So yeah. it's hard to get those hard figures. I agree with Terrence. Like, you got to learn the fundamentals you can from the book, but then go find local people and pick their brains, get their spreadsheet, and do what you can to download their brain. Yeah, Daniel, the most important thing is really understanding the neighborhood. I would say where people lose money is they over-renovate or under-renovate. So you have to know... So the number one question you need to ask yourself when, you, when you're when you looking at a place is, who is the ideal resident here? And then you backfill from there, right? So if I know who the resident is, then I can then I can build to that. Okay, is this a young professional? Is this a young professional that's going to be entertaining a lot? Is this a young professional that's going to be making how much money? Are they going to want stainless steel? Are they going to want a really custom niche uh, backsplash in the kitchen? Are they going to want like creative tile in the shower? Are they going to want a mural? Are they going to want... You know, you know, these are all the things. So you have to know who your ideal resident is, and then you work backwards from there. Great advice. So another question from Daniel. Oh, uh, Roald Danino, my book, not fancy, the 2021 Guide to Colorado Real Estate Investing Strategies. It'll actually be out in a couple of weeks. But let's go back to Daniel's other question here. Terrence, how do you approach creating your punch list for every phase of the construction? And how do you structure the bonus to incentivize workers to get ahead of schedule, to complete ahead of schedule? Yeah, spent a lot of time on this, Daniel. That's a fantastic question. So the number one thing is you have to have an ICA, independent contractor agreement, and you know you should have your attorney create that. And then in the, you know, in the addendum, you're gonna put the scope of work and you're gonna put the timeline for pay, right? And so we agree. So we walk, you know, my GC, uh, you know, Zach, who does a great job. He's been with me for well over a year now. You know, he's going to walk the property with our subs and we're going to agree on a timeline and a scope of work. Right. And then I basically incentivize them. Right. Every day that that unit is vacant costs me money and my partner's money. So I'm trying to align interest. Right. Speed and quality. And so the number one thing for me is if they can get it done faster and we can get it cleaned and I can move someone in faster. So the faster that they work, the faster I can start collecting rent, we make more money. And I want to, I want to incentivize for that speed and quality. And so we put that in the ICA. So every week that they finish ahead of time, we'll give them a $500 bonus, or if it's a larger project, maybe a little bit more, but per unit, roughly, I'm giving about a $500 bonus for every week that they finish ahead of time. And if they finish late, I do the opposite. I double it and it's a thousand. So if we say, if we agree, if Chris is my subcontractor and he's coming in there doing the floors and paint, then I would say, Chris, if you finish in we, in seven weeks, I'll give you $500 above what we agreed to. If you finish in nine weeks, I'm going to take $1,000 off your final payment. So I'm aligning interest, but I have to, you have to make sure, Daniel, that it's all in writing and very clear. And you have to make sure they understand that. Because the last thing you want with your contractors, just like brokers or lenders or anybody else that's on your team, is you want to strengthen trust and you want to build a long-term relationship. One of the reasons why I've been able to do construction cheaper and faster than almost all of my competition in Denver is I've had the same guys doing my projects since like 2014. 
literally since 2014, I've had some of the same crews, plumbers, roofers, tilers, painters. I mean, the same. Naturally, people move and things happen, but like the core group has been with me. And so the way to strengthen trust is to clearly define expectations and have it all in writing. Have really strong, clear boundaries, clearly communicate that. And I think you'll set yourself up for success. But you do want to line interest on quality and time. But have it in writing. Every all time I'm not, I usually get bit where the sun doesn't shine. And I'm like, man, I knew this, but I learned that lesson again. And most of the time, the reason why people don't put things in writing is because they're in a hurry. I move as fast as anybody. But you have to, if you move fast, that's fine. But have people around you that are very thorough and are going to do the paperwork for you. So we've got great people on my team and we always have an ICA signed and executed and you know understood. They sign it, I sign it. That way we make sure there's no misunderstandings. All right. We got lots of great questions coming in. We'll answer a few more. But just as a quick reminder, our show officially launches June 3rd with Sterling Wright in two weeks from this Thursday. So basically in about exactly two weeks from now, we'll be finishing up our live Q&A to promote the show. And Sterling Show will drop right after that as well. So make sure you come back to this YouTube channel and check that show out. Yeah, let's give him a little sneak peek. So we've got Sterling White, who's a BP contributor. He's done some amazing stuff. He's got an incredible story. And he might have the, you know, maybe some of the funniest jokes of any guest, right? We don't really market for that, but like he's he's got some really good one-liners you're going to want to you're going to want to check out. And then after that we have Robert Martinez, right? The apartment rock star out of Houston, Texas, raised over 120 million dollars, has I think owns and managed over 4,000 units, has won like operator of the year in the multifamily space several years in a row. Then we also have Van and Kyle, right? Van Hagee and Kyle Marcotte. Yep, out of they're out of Austin, Texas. Kyle dropped out of college, started syndicating in college. Van uh, is a senior in college. They've both syndicated over 400 units. They just recently did their first uh, syndication on their own. I think over 70 units in Austin. They've got really cool stories. And they're like 21, 22. They're like they're 20. Young, young yeah, they guys. did their first deals when they were 20. Yeah. So really cool story there. And then our fourth one is Rod Cleef. Rod Cleef, the mentor of mentors. Yeah. He's got some incredible stuff. He's very motivated. I walked away very like filled and motivated from him. And and the punchline from Rob, and he's going to extrapolate on this. You're going to want to hear him say it because he says it much better than I do, is always be looking to add value. That was one of the things I took away from Rod. He's always looking to add value to people in his network. And that's how he's built up an incredible business. And he's known as the multifamily operator and one of the top mentors in the space. That's just a little taste Oh yeah, of what you got coming. So we got time for two more questions, everyone. Amir says, hello, I appreciate you guys for sharing your experience with us. These days, there are often a lot of gurus in the market. How can I find someone trusted to work with for the first investment? Chris, I think this is a great question for you. You and I talk a lot about gurus. You've been in the marketing space for a long time. What's your advice to people when they ask you that? Uh, I mean, it goes back to a lot of what you said, going back to those first three steps. I mean, number one, knowing your goals is very important. And number three, networking relationships. Those two things lead to a lot of finding a lot of great guys, a lot of great mentors, a lot of great, uh, a lot of people in your life. I find great, I've had great networking from the bigger pockets forum. Those are phenomenal areas. That's actually how you and I met mm -hmm. Terrence, like about three years ago. Now we've done a bunch of deals together. We've done other stuff together. Now we have a bigger pocket show together. That's the power of networking on there. So I like bigger pockets. I like LinkedIn. I like Google. And of course, going to local meetups. But we've been effective meeting people because when we meet with people, we go in there wanting to add value. And you and I very, very clearly know what our goals are and our next steps. And we can communicate it and tell people, here's what we're doing. Is there, you know, what can we do together on here? So go out there, research people and network, network, network but know what you want to achieve in life. Yeah, and Chris and I agree on this, but there's a lot of people that disagree. I mean, a lot of the people that we interviewed, the common theme, which I was really shocked by, but I think almost every guest paid for a mentor. So there's one school of thought, Amir, is you can pay for a mentor in your market, get to know them, research them, talk to people that they've helped, but paying for a mentor, even though I've never done it and Chris has not done it, there's a lot of people that have done that and have had great success. If you don't want to pay, then you need to be able to add disproportionate value to that person. Right. So people that reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, hey, I want to do this. I want to do this. Can you help me? They need to be able to come and say, hey, I want help with this, but I can do this for you. Or I can give you this piece of advice. I can open up this door for you. So if you're going to ask someone to help you for free and they're experienced and they have the ability to help you and they're going to make the time, then you need to come to that meeting with some ideas on how you can either solve a problem, open some doors or add disproportionate value.
add disproportionate value if someone's going to do something for free. So here's a follow-up question. What about women to network with? Where can I, you know, I guess, where can you find women networking events? So, I mean, same thing. Like there are so many networking events with different topics out there. There's commercial real estate women networking events. There's meetups for women investing. I would go in the bigger pockets forum and set up keywords around women in investing or similar keywords like that. I've seen threads out there as well. Here's the other thing though. If you can't find the event or find the topic, you go create it and you become that center of influence. That's what I, I did here that. in Denver. I love that, yeah. <clears throat> Years ago, I yeah. wanted to learn investing in Denver. I saw no one in the space doing well. I was like, oh, great, I can do that. Was I an expert back then? Nope. But I started a podcast. I know some great people. I was able to find the experts, learn from them, and that became a big connector in Denver, which has been tremendous for my business and also tremendous for my own investing career as well. So if you can't find what you want, go out there and create it. I love that. That's really great. Yeah, totally. All right. So... Um, all right, we're at the 30 minute mark. We gotta hop off, guys. We gotta record some more stuff. Bigger pockets. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been fantastic. We enjoy doing this. Terrence and I walked away energized from doing this. So please, please, please come to jump, come join us in two weeks when the first show drops. Give us some love, like the videos, like the channel, leave comments. They'll help us do more and more shows and it fuels us. So everyone, thank you. Terrence, thank you. That was great, Chris. Remember, everybody, write down your goals, know your location and network, network, network. Deals is directly related to relationships. Go build relationships. Get it done. All right. We'll see you next Thursday, Bigger Pockets.